part I didn't cover for delirium is the treatment of delirium. And ultimately, you as a consult psychiatrist, this is going to be your part, and this is what they're going to ask you to do. So remember, the first thing you're going to say is there's no specific medication for delirium. The goal, obviously, is to treat the underlying medical condition, whatever that is. If it's a UTI, if it's some other infection like pneumonia, if it's post-surgical, whatever the case is, you're going to review the chart and you're going to say, let's first rule out all the medical causes that could possibly do this. You're going to look at labs, you're going to look for electrolyte abnormalities, etc. The other important goal is obviously to provide physical and sensory and environmental support. So you don't want the person to get hurt. They really don't know what they're doing. They have this waxing waning level of consciousness. Their attention is short and unfocused. They could easily get hurt. So make sure there's a safe environment. The other one is you might want to put this patient on a one-to-one. -one. You might want to put a companion in the room or a sitter in the room or have a family member watch the person because, again, this is going to help to keep them oriented. It's going to keep them... Uh, it's going to help to, them to stay focused a little bit better and with someone in the room it's another additional safety measure. The other little things you can do to help the patient is open the windows during the day, let the sunlight in, put a clock in the room so that they see what time it is, put a calendar, uh, most hospitals have something on the wall like a like a whiteboard type of situation where they can where they can use a marker to kind of say what today's date is, who your nurse is, what the plan is for today, if you're going to scheduled for any tests, etc. So that also helps to orient the patient. And you could try other things like bring in some, some stuff from home, like things that might remind them of their home to help them feel a little more comfortable. But the nitty gritty for a psychiatrist is of course the psychopharmacology because that's what they're going to ask you to kind of do, especially if the patient's agitated. If the patient's not agitated, you might not even get consulted. But a lot of times they consult you because the person's screaming uncontrollably, crying uncontrollably, uh, trying to pull out their IVs, trying to get out of bed when they, when they have a deficit and can't walk. So this is all the kind of stuff that's going to prompt them to call you and they're going to say, well, what are you going to do about it because the patient's dangerous. So remember, there's no drug officially approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration for the treatment of hospital-acquired uh, delirium or hospital-associated delirium. The two major symptoms of delirium that really require the treatment are as if there's any psychosis, hallucinations, delusions, etc., and insomnia when they're not sleeping. Because, of course, if you're not sleeping, that might also be a precipitant for delirium if you're staying awake all night, if you can't sleep in the hospital, etc., a commonly used drug, obviously, for psychosis and probably your go-to medication with the most data behind it, most research and longest going, is going to be haloperidol or Haldol, which is an antipsychotic medication. The initial dose, obviously, for especially for elderly patients, you want to start low and go slow, right? That's the typical story. So you might want to start with two milligrams or so, or even one, one and a half milligrams, depending on the situation but somewhere around two to six milligrams IM, and you want to repeat that as necessary to control the agitation. As soon as the patient's calm, you want to transition to oral. So transition from IM or IV medication to oral medication. At this point, oral medication is a better choice. Um, basically, you want to have two daily doses are usually adequate. So two-thirds of the dose should be given at bedtime, again, because you want the patient to sleep. You want them to regain that ability and you want to decrease the risk for insomnia so you're going to give majority of your dose at night and the other one third during the day just to kind of control the behavior a little bit so they're not so agitated the effective dose is obviously anywhere from 5 to 40 milligrams a day but most patients are going to be elderly and most are going to require obviously lower doses and how of course is associated with prolonged QTC so make sure you have an EKG review the EKG before administering any medication so the use of second generation antipsychotics, now I got this question myself during one of my rotations. I was doing a medicine rotation in my first year and the doctor said, well, what is the medication of choice for delirium? And I said, well, there is no medication of choice. And then I, when he pushed me a little bit on it, I said, well, how doll would be a good choice? And he said, no, quetiapine. So quetiapine is a good medication also for delirium. It's a second generation antipsychotic along with risperdal or risperidone 
or lansipine, suppressed, donair, fiprosol, they have all can be kind of tried, but there's not a lot of data supporting any of these things. The quetiapine, there is some, some good data, and mostly comes out of the intensive care journals. So the critical care units tend to like quetiapine for agitated delirium. And it is a good medication, again, because it's very sedating, so you give it like 50 milligrams at night, and that might control the patient overall, you know, control their behavior, help them sleep, etc. So it, it is a pretty good medication. I don't think, but again, like this idea that like that's the gold standard is not necessarily true. Um, but if you talk to some of the critical care docs, they will recommend that medication. Zoprazidone so is interesting because at lower doses, it has an activating effect. I wouldn't recommend it to you. Um, so if you give 20 milligrams, it actually might cause the reverse response. It may become more activated, more agitated. So I don't particularly like that medication. You also have to worry about QTC. That's one of the major things to look at with suprazidone. Orlanzapine. Orlanzapine is fine, and it is a, a good medication in these cases because they make an oral disintegrating tab, and they also make a uh, another IM formulation. So again, anything that you can administer that is for someone who is having trouble swallowing, for someone who um, you know obviously needs the medication to work faster, you want to do those IM medications initially. So that's why orlanzapine works. But again, watch for the metabolic effects, watch for people with diabetes, etc. For insomnia, it's best to be treated with benzodiazepines, although that statement, although from Kaplan Sadics, I kind of disagree with that a little bit. I don't really feel like benzodiazepines in the elderly is the best treatment. If I was really trying to deal with insomnia, I would probably start with something like trazodone, maybe 25 to 50 milligrams at night to see if the trazodone helps to sedate them a little bit again and, and improve their sleep quality or maybe even something like Remeron, which is mirtazapine. These are both the more, the newer generation um, antidepressant medications. But those two medications I would probably be starting with, especially the trazodone. It has a pretty good track record and a pretty low side effect profile. The atypical antipsychotics are obviously effective for delirium, like I said, and they have, of course, lower risk of extrapyramidal side effects. And, but there's little in the way of head-to-head -head trials. And you'll see this with all psychiatric medication in general, in my opinion. There's very few head-to-head -head trials that say, like, this antidepressant's better than that one. Or, you know, this particular antipsychotic medication is far superior to all the others because they don't really compare them that way, at least not yet. Um, and a lot of these medications have proven to have similar efficacy with the differences coming in side effect profile. So a lot of times you're making decisions on medications based on side effect profile, which is fine. Um, it, it doesn't really matter as long as you're doing the right thing for the patient. Some additional information here about Haldol. So again, Haldol continues to be the gold standard medication for treatment of delirium. It's, uh, although I said there's no absolute FDA approved medication, this tends to be the go-to medication. And uh, it's pretty, it's relatively safe, relatively effective. That's the key point. It works and it's pretty safe. Numerous support for risperidone, orlanzapine, quetiapine, but there's some studies that support these. There's just not a whole lot of data to substantiate those, those trials. They're kind of small trials, maybe not as, as robust as some of the ones for Haldol. Although again, like I said, critical care docs, Quetiapine is the go-to medication in most cases. And that pretty much covers all of the pharmacotherapy for delirium. Delirium in general is a relatively short topic. I tried to cover it all in one in one uh, video, but unfortunately it was way too long. It turned out to be like 25 minutes, 30 minutes of, of talk, which is a little bit too much for uh, uploading to YouTube. But this second part is relatively short. It should be a good introduction to pharmacotherapy. Um, you know, continue to read the literature, continue to update yourself on medications used in, for delirium. But again, delirium is not really, um, a, per se, a psychiatric condition. It's just more so a byproduct of medical condition. Anyway, I'll leave you guys with that. Good luck out there in the wards.